The following program is brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom. Welcome to the Alora Center for the Arts. We are located in a restored three-story limestone school building in the heart of Alora. Built in 1856, the Alora Public School was closed in 1996, and in 2002, the Alora Center for the Arts opened. We are now celebrating our 15th anniversary, and the Alora Center for the Arts is very proud to present a full year of exhibits in the Minarovich Gallery. We start the year off with artists in residence, showcasing their work and offering workshops. Hi, my name is Maggie Vanderwhite, and I'd like to welcome you to my solo show, my solo exhibition called Being Here Now. It's being hosted by the Alora Center for the Arts, which is this beautiful, iconic building in the center of beautiful Alora. Uh, and I was invited to be the guest artist for the month of January. And um, I am also offering a class this weekend, uh, a painting class. And I had a beautiful opening and book launch here so I'd really like to thank the Center for the Arts for this wonderful opportunity to show my work near where I live, among my friends. It means a lot. Uh, the exhibit is in the Minarovich Gallery on the main floor when you first walk into the building. And it's called Being Here Now because I wanted to uh, focus my work on moments or experiences or thoughts so that each piece captures something that's iconic and true for me and res maybe resonates with, hopefully resonates with other people as well. Um, I'd like to walk around the gallery, talk about the different pieces and their inspiration, perhaps a little bit about how they were made, and I hope that that's of interest to all of you. So this is the first piece we're going to talk about. It's called Left Out in the Rain. I did a series of pieces about water and rust uh, is a technique, rusting is a technique that I use. So these panels were rusted fabric uh, wrapped around um, old objects and immersed with a bit of vinegar and water. That's the technique and you'll see it in other pieces as well. There's a pair of shears here and um, obviously I'm a sewer so I use a lot of scissors and cutting materials and I wanted to give the impression of water sort of streaming down. And, and, th and I was thinking about how water is wonderful and life-giving and essential for our lives, but it can also be very dangerous. There are floods and tsunamis and, and then the other side of that is, you know, when there's no water and there's a drought. So water is a double-edged kind of a thing, which is why I put a double-edged object in, in the piece as well. This is indigo dyed by a friend and, um, it's part, this piece is part of a new series I'm developing called Windows and Walls. So this is me looking out of, uh, the, through a window with various panes. All right, this piece is called The Guardians. And my husband, Fred Meredith, um, and I went to visit the gravesite of his father at Mount Pleasant Cemetery a few years ago, right on the anniversary of his death to celebrate his father's life. I never met his father. He's been gone a long time. But on the actual grave were leaves, these leaves, and we gathered them. The, the whole cemetery is very beautiful, thousands of trees, and these are oaks and maples, and they are so tall and, and beautiful, and it was in October, so they'd fallen to the ground, and this is a technique that uses natural plant material and sometimes bits of rusty metal to um, help uh, in a boiling, an immersion boiling process to uh, bring the pigments from the leaves directly onto the cloth. This is uh, wool and you can see sometimes when there's metal that the outlines are um, uh, of the leaves become darker or highlighted or heightened in some way. But um, it was a, it's a piece that belongs to my husband. It's not for sale, but it was a, a Christmas gift for him a few years ago. Okay, this piece is called Hands Off, and it's a few years old. We've been empty nesters now for about two years. Our youngest left home. And uh, when the kids are at home, uh, we as parents, were, when the kids were at home, we were very involved parents. The kids played sports, and we did lots of things with them and for them, and their presence filled the house. And then when they were gone, they started, they started these new lives. And um, 
and we didn't really know how to be involved in their lives as much. So Hands Off is, is created with a woman with no hands and not even any feet really because she's just finding her footing. Um, she's finding a way to be, a, to be a, an effective and loving and, and good parent to um, these children that don't live at home and don't need the same things anymore. So hands off but uh, heart open and, and hopefully lovingly connected in, in exciting new ways. And in fact that is what has happened in our lives with our kids. It was made with um, a few pieces of cloth pieced together the same kind of um, uh, process with the leaves. You don't see them as sharply or clearly. You can see little bits of the rusty metal and then a bit of chemical dye as well. And this was made, the rusty part that's especially prominent in this piece is a horseshoe. So um, that's what shapes her head. On the other side of the cloth you can see the, the outline of the horseshoe very clearly and there's a piece over there with a the horseshoe as well that sort of ties it together. So one of the uh, uh, leaves, botanical material that is, uh, bot materials that are most effective in giving off color onto cloth are eucalyptus leaves and there's a, over a thousand different varieties of eucalyptus leaves. Mostly I get them from the florist, that's where these came from, and um, printed them on wool and then did lots of hand embroidery and it's called kimono for a eucalyptus tree. It's a simple sweet piece I would say but the leaves are so beautiful and it's so exciting to be able to capture that moment of the leaves being alive because as we know all, plant, all life passes through transition and dies but to be able to capture it and sort of lock it in is a very nice way to keep the now going on. And this piece is called Rain at Last. We traveled to California to um, the Napa Valley a few years ago, Fred and I did. And we had a lovely time with all the wine, and, but there was a drought going on. It was, it was really dry and there are huge eucalyptus uh, trees lining the, the roadways there and th the leaves were a foot and a half deep, or maybe that's exaggerating, say a, six or seven inches deep. There were just leaves that had fallen from the trees. They were just lying there and I knew the eucalyptus gave great great um, pigment on cloth so I gathered some and um, the day that we left it actually rained for the first time in about six months there but they had been going through quite a lot of drought it's better now but it was really quite dire for a while so this is again embroidered in a similar way as that eucalyptus you can see the completely different shapes of these eucalyptus leaves and these eucalyptus leaves and then there's a bit of chemical pigment as well with this piece and these were printed as these were. This, it was two pieces of cloth. So I put down a piece of cloth, I put the leaves on it, I put another piece of cloth, wrapped it in a tight bundle, bound it tightly, boiled it with a little bit of mordant and, um, and waited for a while. And then this is a mirror image of this. And you can see this has happened very clearly. That's just a single piece. But these are all mirror images of each other where the leaf was in the middle like a sandwich. And and then the, the pigment was, came out on both sides. This piece is called Filtered Light. It's also done on wool. The last number of pieces have been done on a, a really nice tight uh, wool that rug hookers use. It's a, it's a beautiful cloth. Um, it's, it was travel, it's traveled for three years in a show. Um, the Surface Design Association had a show called The Edge of the Forest. And so this piece was accepted in that show and it traveled. And um, my parents used to live on this property in Rockwood and they had a driveway that was about a quarter mile long and it was a very narrow driveway completely surrounded by that cedar forest that's around Rockwood, Ontario. And the light that used to come through was just really beautiful, you know, it would just slant through these branches and there'd just be little glimpses of light. And so that's what, uh, that was my depiction of what being on the edge of a forest was. It was just this beautiful filtered light. And it's also created with uh, plant material. These are strawberries and um, strawberry runners and strawberry roots and some rusty metal objects as well. You can see the where the rust sort of peeps through. These were bandsaws. And the bandsaws, I got a great collection of rusty old bandsaws from the little tykes, uh, or little folks, sorry, little folks um, uh, ruin that's just on the other side of the bridge in Alora, right on the other side of downtown. And um, they're in the process of completely rehabilitating that for the new um, mill. I don't know what it's going to be called, but they're making a big conference center and a hotel and, uh, and workshop space, all kinds of retail spaces. It's going to be beautiful, but my kids used to go there and skateboard. And um, when we were helping them clean up, we wanted to make sure that all the dangerous things were gone. So I gathered some of these. So this has got a kind of a a history to it. Uh, it's connected to this community and a bit of my past as well growing up in a house in Rockwood to give that filtered light. You can see a little strawberry leaf right there, 
little strawberry shapes of the strawberry leaves and then the runners and the roots sort of going all over the place. This piece is called runoff. Um, I don't travel all the time, but I travel enough and whenever I can, I get a window seat in the airplane to be able to look down and look at the topography that's unfolding uh, under, underneath our airplane and just be absolutely amazed that here I am in the air looking at all these beautiful mountains and again with the water theme uh, seeing places that are snowy, seeing places that are very dry, seeing the effect that the water has that's what this piece is about. So it's called runoff because when things pour on down it's it's quite dramatic and beautiful or when it's just frozen there. So these are painted panels I painted. Uh, I use a special textile paint called Color V that I love. I've been using it for many years and um, and then it's machine quilted. I, in fact all the pieces in this show are pieced by machine and quilted by machine which means putting attaching the three layers together and then some of them have hand embellishment on them as the the um, kimono pieces did. This piece is called Lynx and I think it's pretty obvious what it is. It was a rusty old chain that I got probably at a barn sale or something like that. can't quite remember. I've got a really good collection of rusty objects and it's done on cashmere and um, silk. It's a cashmere silk blend and it's sort of linked with an embroidery stitch as well. I wanted to do a, an embroidery stitch that sort of um, imitated or mimicked, mimicked that. And it's just about how we're all sort of connected loosely, sometimes really well, sometimes the connections fall apart. And the connections can last through many generations if we're lucky. This piece is called There is a Season and it has a sister piece called um, To Everything, obviously a biblical reference. Um, when Fred and I were traveling in Colorado, we came across an, a deserted mining town, a silver mining town, and it was uh, full of homes and rusty bed springs and, and doors that were open into absolutely abandoned places. I have a real interest and love of abandoned places. I find them haunting and beautiful. So uh, we carried home some of these rusty paint can lids, and there's a piece across the way that's sort of bounces off of this. This was, is also wool. It was dyed with um, lots of little rusty objects you can see. I don't, I, don't even, I don't even know what they are. They're like little squares of rusty metal. I don't, I don't know what lots of them were. The bandsaws I knew, but this I don't know. And, and walnut that I gathered from the backyard. So walnut gives a beautiful rich brown. It's been used forever uh, to give it to color cloth. And then this piece in the middle was folded in half. It had lots of plant material. On the one side, you just saw the, the effect of the rusty paint can lid. You can see the little places where they were, it closed the lid. And then on this side, it had plants. And here are some of the binding marks and the wrinkles in the cloth and some other plant material that's kind of vague. Um, the idea that everything comes and goes, everything has its time. It felt like it was a good fit for the theme of the show. And um, uh, I think these rich browns are just so beautiful eh, that you can get that just from dropping some walnuts. And the squirrels in the backyard went absolutely crazy when I was boiling, boiling all this up in the backyard. And then when I th threw out the, the, uh, the parts I didn't want, they were very happy with me too. So this piece is called From Lenin to Lenin. So John Lennon and then Communist Lennon. Uh, Fred and I celebrated our 10th anniversary by doing a cruise up the Danube and um, then spending extra time in Prague this summer. Very lucky, beautiful trip. We started with the communist part. We started actually in Berlin and traveled with my son there before, before our, uh, our trip and um, were very moved by uh, the, even, you know, decades later, the effects of communism on the architecture, on the people's psyche, on, um, and then how some of it's just completely gone away. This was uh, the Berlin Wall. So it's a piece of eco-dyed cotton that the same way that I've done lots of the other pieces. It's very amorphous. The cotton doesn't take the print as clearly as the wool does usually. And there were messages on the west side of the wall. And I took many photographs. This is the one that made me cry. This is the one that I found incredibly moving to think that this little piece of concrete, I mean guarded by guys with guns and dogs and raz razor wire and you know this this no man's land space between, but the people were just just as big, uh, far away from each other as this room, but they couldn't be together. So somebody wrote that to somebody who was on the other side. I found that very powerful and quite symbolic of um, what communism kind of did. 
Then we traveled all through Bulgaria and Croatia and Serbia and um, not Croatia, Serbia. And um, uh, we ended up in Prague and we stayed four days in Prague. It was, it was so, so, so beautiful. And that had gone through communism as well. And at the very end of it, John, Len John Lennon died. Well, not at the very end. In 1980, John Lennon died. And somebody had somehow heard about John Lennon and the Beatles and their music. And they put something on this wall, this random wall that was on the other side of the St. Charles Bridge. And um, as a tribute to him. And it was covered over. And then someone else put something. They'd sneak in. Because it was really dangerous for them to even be doing this. And they'd and it kept happening and happening and happening. Eventually, in 89, they were allowed to do it. And now there's a wall that's probably, I should know this, maybe 200 feet long by, and it's about 10 feet tall. And it's completely covered with graffiti, life-affirming messages of hope and love. Um, people come and they just paint. They just paint wherever and whatever they want right on top of everybody else's stuff. So this is a piece that's constantly evolving. We saw some photographers on the bridge selling photographs of the wall, and what they'd photographed wasn't there anymore. It was gone. So we were, we, the first time we got there, we went every day because I loved it so much. The first day we got there, it was in the afternoon. There was this late afternoon sunlight slanting down on the wall. There were people singing, playing guitars. There were people jumping in front of the wall. There were people hugging and kissing and, 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 and everybody taking pictures. So I took a whole lot of pictures. And then this is a, tr uh, a, a technique that I use. It's called photo transfer. You can buy cloth, put it through that special that you put through your uh, regular printer. And then I can fiddle with things digitally. And then I stitch the together and then quilted it in the usual way. So this piece is called From Lenin to Lenin. It, it's actually called From Lenin to Lenin. It's, it's reversed the other way. Because I prefer to end on a note of hope. <laughs> it was really, really beautiful. We went, um, the last time we went was in the very early morning. We got up super early morning and we were the only ones there and it was really beautiful. Okay, this is called Fragile Strength, and this is on cotton, so you can see how, again, it's a sort of a soft focus way to do this eco-dyeing. Using plant material, you can see little hints of leaves, maybe. Sometimes you can see bundle marks, that's these wrapping marks that act as a resist for the color. And all the different natural tones that come from the plant material, so pinkish and gray, a little bit of gold, lots of taupe, lots of browns, and once in a while a bit of black from either the metal that was, here's a, probably some metal that was in it, or, or from d different plant material. Fragile strength, here I am using these completely fragile little pieces of leaves that um, when I'm done with them, I'll put them in my backyard and they will be gone in the spring. They'll just disintegrate. But strength because many, many fragile things, very, very brittle, like a butterfly or like a tiny little hummingbird or, you know, the butterflies that can fly all the way, the monarchs that can fly all the way to, um, to Mexico. I mean, how crazy is that? So many, many fragile things are actually quite strong and that's what this piece is about, celebrating that. It's called Rust, Blight and Blues and it's kind of a... Uh, um, take off on red, white, and blue. That's what I was doing. So it's red, white, and blue. I digitally altered some of the colors. Again, my photographs. We made a trip to Detroit on July the 4th a few years ago and were uh, inner, city, inner city Detroit. And then we went off after that and met friends who lived just outside of Detroit in a beautiful little community and had a lovely restaurant meal and visited them in their business. And it all just feels like a lovely, normal, green houses, Main Street kind of a place. But just, you know, 20 minutes down that highway in inner city Detroit, this is happening. So it's, it's, it's completely disintegrating. There are um, uh, big vehicles sometimes. Some of it's just left like this, but this one was actively, I was going to go in and take more pictures, but the guy chased me off because I was too close. So he was actively uh, taking down that building. Um, there's lots of things that are covered up with razor wire. That was an old train station. This is just an apartment building. And you can look into these buildings and you can see how people lived. There's, a, there's graffiti here. This one says, clean your room. Well, there's no glass on the window and it's, you know, it's open to the elements. And here's the top of, I think this is, this is the top of this building, what it looks like 
it's, it's like they started to take part of it down or dem demolish it, the, the demo started, but it wasn't finished and so then it's just left. All of these are empty, uh, this is closer to downtown, but these are all empty windows. Or, uh, there's no windows there, there's no glass there. So those are just abandoned buildings, really just some very tall ones. And you can sort of see the lath and plaster. This was a factory of some kind. This was too, and the graffiti was um, uh, really poignant, sometimes funny. There was a whole lot of pieces I didn't put in. Um, this one says brains. You know, this one says tough. Uh, there's a kind of a sad, very sad face. There's a hang loose. <laughs> My kids, I have um, kids in their 20s, they really like graffiti quite a bit, so I've started to look for it and take pictures of stuff they like, and then I realized I was getting drawn in as well, as you can see from the, from the Lenin wall, that there's often very uh, lovely, important, strong messages that are presented in this public way. So this was a an observation of a, you know, a, a day's drive through a place that's stayed with me very strongly. And I hope we can, you know, keep our little earth together and keeping it prosper. That would be nice. This piece is called Postcards from New Orleans, again, based on our travels. And uh, we went um, around Christmas time down to NOLA uh, on a road trip. So we drove and drove, and this piece is also about water. and. Um, I decided I was going to really focus on water. It's an obvious fit for New Orleans and, and sort of pay. I didn't do a lot of post-Katrina imagery. I guess I could have had, we didn't drive around in those places because it just, we just didn't at that, and that holiday. But I did take a lot of the storm drains. And they say different things, drain and water. This one says sewer, but it also says sower. So I thought that that was funny and kind of ironic. And um, these are some of the, um, at Bayou's, we went looking for alligators, and there's one of those little, um, uh, what do they call that when they make, a moonshine. It's a moonshine um, little hut out in the, in the bush. And this is the cemetery in New Orleans. We just watched uh, a, a TV show yesterday that was shot in that, and they, we had a lovely tour of the cemetery, very interesting. And this was very amusing. We were driving down the Mississippi Valley, and in Arkansas we came across this field that was full of rusty bathtubs. There were thousands of rusty bathtubs in this field. So of course we stopped and I took pictures, and, and there's the pier downtown. So, oh, and this, this is, um, this was where they, it was on a slave plantation. It's a great, great, great big pot. Those are just reflections of uh, leaves falling that are in the water and of the trees above it. But that's how they used to make sugar cane, or boil the sugar cane down to make sugar in these great big rusty, well they weren't rusty in the day, but they're rusty now, great big vats that they had to keep a fire going under all the time. This is a sister piece to the one that's just across the way called, uh, there is a season, and it's called My Father Was a Painter. My father was a trade instructor. My father was Ike Vanderweight. There's another piece about him over there as well. I'll talk about him again. But he was a trade instructor at the Guelph Correctional Center for his whole career once he immigrated from Holland. And then in the evenings, he would go out and paint or wallpaper or refinish furniture for clients. He was a really, really busy guy. He he um, did amazing things in a home, turning it from, you know, awful looking to beautiful with his, his beautiful skills. And so this is sort of about our family as well though. Lots of onion skins from my cooking, lots of plant material from the garden that my um, brother planted. And um, my mother was a, uh, is a really good cook as well. So she, you know, onions were sort of the beginning of everything. And these rusty kind of things are, are from onion skins. This piece is called View Through Clouds. It's the same concept as runoff, looking out of an airplane through clouds this time, looking down at these little pinpoints of life and wondering what's going on down there. Sometimes there's snow, sometimes there's blue sky, sometimes there's dark um, uh, bits of land or forest or roads and the quilting pattern is supposed to be pathways and roads that might join all of these little places that are peekaboo uh, views through the cloud. This piece is called Winter Sun. It's about um, dementia. It was rust, uh, rusted around an old tractor seat. There are keys, there are 
doors and or windows, there are more keys, there are holes, it's all sort of disintegrating. And it's about when those keys don't fit those places anymore and when the end of life is coming in, it's hard, it's hard. I've had various family members go through it and it's, it's, a, it's a tough process. I'm sure lots of people can relate to that. This piece is called Ike's Legacy. Ike was my dad, the same guy that was a painter. And uh, when they immigrated from Canada, like many immigrants, they lived very frugally. They had to be super careful. So my dad refinished furniture and he would pull the nails out and then save them even though they were rusty and crooked and then he would refinish the furniture. We eat off a table that my father and, and off chairs that my father reclaimed from places and, and so that, that furniture goes on. But my, uh, my uncle was a carpenter and so my father gave him the rusty old nails in case he could use them and, and then they gave them to me as a gift. So I made this piece with nails that pioneer Canadians used to build uh, anti now for us antique furniture um, and my father touched 50 years ago or 60 years ago and my uncle did or didn't use and now I'm using it in a piece of cloth. So it's called Ike, Ike's Legacy. And it's a little bit about the immigration experience, the waves, the groups, they come, it's hard, they have to be so careful, they don't know how it's going to turn out. It's, it's a very challenging thing and I was just listening, driving here, listening to um, a Syrian immigrant talking about his experience of coming to Canada. Um, and how successful it's been, but also the challenges of immigration, the, the language issues and the culture shock and the find, making a living and finding new friends and family. So it's obviously a, a, an ongoing issue and this is about my father's experience. Part of my experience of being here now is that I feel lucky. And we had the idea to hang this over a door. Apparently that's a tra traditional thing to be done with horseshoes is to hang them over a door and you had to hang them with the bowl down so that you could capture your luck and keep it in the bowl. And so that's called feeling lucky and it's done with some plants. I think it was birch leaves and again, you can really see the clear imprint of the um, horseshoe there. Business to contact me, uh, again, my name is Maggie Vanderwhite. And um, my business is called Stone Threads and my website is www.stonethreads.ca and there's information there about um, upcoming events and workshops and if you would like me to lecture or teach, how to get a hold of me that way, find out what's going on. This year I wrote a book, I called it Stone Threads <laughs> because that seemed important. It's got a bit of, um, it's got a bit of my beginnings and my family and um, growing up, uh, the influence of being part of the Cree community in Northern Quebec and my kids, and then it goes on to um, what I make, what I've made over the years in various, various series. It's got a lot of photographs, and it's got some writing and some stories, and um, a selection of painted work and traditional work and um, thread painted work and uh, felted work and there's the piece that's in the show and this is my wrap and rust technique a little bit about that and then at the very end of the book there are a few pages where I talk about things that help me stay on track creatively um, things to, things to think about ways to think about them how to organize my studio and um, some encouragement about how to talk to your muse so that it wants to come out and play with you. I didn't know I was going to even write this section, but it sort of came up at the end and said I want to be in the book too. So the book is $30. It's available at the center. It's also available on my website. I'd like to say a really big thank you to Adam Olivero for his very easygoing and gentle and professional approach and um, Whiteman uh, Cable for contacting me and giving me this wonderful opportunity to connect with my community and talk a little bit about my show. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the talk. For the full list of youth and adult programming and upcoming exhibits, please visit www.ecfta.ca. That's Elora Center for the Arts.ca.
The preceding program was brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom.